Hi everyone, welcome to Lurking for Legends, a live video cast where we talk with people from all walks of the publishing industry. I'm David Kelly, science fiction author, and my awesome co-host, epic fantasy author Richard H. Stevens and Christy Stratus. Unfortunately, Christy can't be with us this week, so you'll have to make do with Richard and myself. <laughs> Lurking for Legends is an interactive broadcast, and we encourage viewers to chime in with questions for our guest or comment on what you hear on the show. And tonight we're chatting with Howard Pell. Hi, Howard. How are Hi. you doing? Hey, Howard. Hi. So to begin with, Howard, uh, how about you just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and uh, your writing and what you what you do? Okay. Um, I'm retired. I've been retired for about eight years now. Um, before I retired, I was in the adult education arena, teaching people um, uh, primarily about, uh, I'm sorry, teaching people primarily about computers and uh, computer software. Um, and uh, when I retired, uh, I was shocked at, at uh, I, I read many books, retirement books, before I retired, thinking I would prepare myself. And um, I was shocked with the things that they didn't cover. And... Uh, there were a lot, there were a lot. Most of them were financial, which was of course important, but um, they missed some other areas. And so, um, while my wife and I were um, took a little short vacation to celebrate my retirement, I uh, loaded up my iPad full of a bunch of trashy novels uh, <laughs> for the beach, and um, got tired of reading those fairly quickly. So I decided to start writing. And I just started writing. I was thinking I would just do a blog. But then after I'd written about 20 pages um, and showed it to some of my friends, they encouraged me to write a book. And that was the birth of my first ever uh, book, which was on all of It's about all the things that I wish people would have told me before I retired. <laughs> So uh, I was having a lot of fun with that. And then uh, my wife and I were traveling through Europe and we, we liked meeting people. We met uh, some very nice people who had actually injured themselves on their, on their uh, tours, touring uh, the castles and cathedrals and whatnot, slipping on, uh, on uh, cobblestones or marble floors or what have you. And, and then I thought, you know, there should be some uh, exercises that people could do after you know 30 or 40 years sitting behind a desk uh some exercises to do the uh, those kinds of things that they want to do in their retirement but weren't really physically fit enough to do them hmm. and uh, i looked i searched on google like everyone else does and was looking for some some uh, fitness exercises for various um, various pastimes, whether it was cycling or canoeing, or the things that retirees want to do. And I came up with nothing. So uh, <laughs> I decided to write another book and uh, collaborated or, or my fitness coach, our fitness coach, my wife and mine, uh, she collaborated with us on writing the second book where we have a bunch of um, things that people want to do in their retirement and how to physically prepare for doing those things. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine that cycling will use a lot different muscles, many mm -hmm. different more muscles than say um, kayaking. Mm. And so uh, we put that book together. Yeah, and that, that's so important to be fit uh, when you go on vacation, you know, whether you're retired or not. Yes. We did a riverboat uh, tour up the Rhine in uh, Europe and we went to a, a great big cathedral in Mainz and they had like the old castle turrets that you could climb up and like you couldn't barely pass each other in these confined. And I had blown my calf muscle playing soccer the week before we left and it was okay going up, but coming down, oh. I, I'm thinking, geez, if I fall, I'm going to take out everyone below me because <laughs> I don't yeah. to stop. So yeah. it's certainly so important to be fit when you go anytime, but especially as we age, uh, you know, I'm, I certainly know that now. It's very poignant that uh, you know it's it's easier to injure yourself, and it's 
takes a longer to recuperate. So it does. I think, uh, being fit and retirement certainly go along together. So then uh, after I, bit, I wrote the two nonfiction books, I've been writing a number of short stories. Uh, I've been writing poetry and uh, getting a, a few of those published in various magazines, typically online magazines. Uh, and uh, I've just a couple of weeks ago finished my very first novel, which is uh, now at the printer. They're going to be giving me my um, proof copy hopefully this week or next. And That's exciting. Yeah, it's really exciting. Uh, this is my first attempt at writing a full-length novel. And, uh, boy, I learned an awful lot. It, <laughs> it could be a daunting project, project, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah. It's got a comment here from uh, C.J. Davidson. It says, I love that you write about this important subject. It's important to prepare early. The book makes a great gift as well as being educational. Thanks, C.J. It's... Um, yeah, I think it does make a great gift, uh, especially um, for your parents. If your parents are just retiring um, or if they've just retired, then I think it's, it's uh, um, especially, again, if you've led a fairly sedentary life and now that you've retired, you want to do, you're going to do all those things that you wanted to do, but work got in the way. So, um, yeah. Nope. Absolutely. It's a great gift to ourselves, too, with our parents. Like, you know, as Dave and I, uh, I don't know about Dave, but as I get closer to retirement, Dave's still a young buck, but <laughs> I need to uh, start thinking about that more and more as well. But so what you were talking about uh, your retirement, prim you wrote that primarily for your friends and then with encouragement of your friends and family, you wrote that first book and you learned things you wish you had known before your retirement. Yes. Now, without spoiling the book, <laughs> you said you had learned nothing of the first book, but obviously you've learned something. So yeah. what what are a couple of those things? Is this getting a fitness coach? Is it uh, like, you know, as we get older, we can't partake in like, let's say, tackle football anymore and <laughs> right. live to brag about the next day without any aches and pain. So what do you suggest? Well, there's a, there's a couple of there's a couple of things. One is, of course, most of the books on the market are financial books and they're talking about saving enough money and how much is enough money and mm. how much will you need and those sorts of things which are important there's no question but i realized fairly early on that there were two other parts of it one of one part is your physical fitness so you've got your financial fitness the second is your physical fitness and being physical physically fit enough to do the things that you want to do like say canoeing um, are you physically fit enough to portage a canoe and um, all the gear that you would need to go uh, into further into lakes and what have you? Um, the second uh, area is uh, being mentally uh, fit or emotionally fit to know the things that you want to do. Um, I've met a lot of people who have um, we reached what I would consider to be a retirement age, but they refuse to retire because they say things like, well, I really wouldn't know what to do with myself if I stopped working. And if they still enjoy what they're doing, if they still enjoy their work, then that's wonderful. Keep doing, keep doing what you love. But some people I've met say, gee, I really wish I could retire. I hate what I'm doing, but... I just sit around the house all day and watch TV. And um, so I, what I do in the book, oh, and, and so I just mentioned too, that you've got these sort of three you know, circles of uh, three areas and kind of like they overlap in the middle, right? All three of them overlap in the middle where you get, you're financially fit, you're physically fit, you're emotionally fit, you know what you want to do, you've got the money to do it, and you've got the physical fitness to do it. So um, a good example of being emotionally fit would be that you, you know, yes, a, a good friend of mine, um, he knew that when he was going to retire, he wanted to be, uh, go back into cycling. He had done a lot of cycling as a, as a young man, and he'd done a lot of swimming. And after reading my book, he said to me, you know, um, I'm taking up cycling again. I'm taking up swimming again. He said, I really didn't want to retire 
but now he's he's doing it. So it's a uh, it, it's it's those three areas I think that a lot of the other retirement books, as good as they are, we're we're missing out on on that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And there's there are other things that that they didn't. Some of the other books didn't mention were things like, uh, for example, when you retire. Um, if you've been fortunate enough to work for an organization that had a dental plan and a medical plan and eyeglasses and that, that um, you may not be fortunate enough to remain under their plan when mm -hmm. you retire. And if you're not, um, there's an awful lot of research you have to do. and You really need to know uh, what you're going to do before you make that jump and get locked in, not locked in, but start using a, a, a private insurance company because they do kind of lock you in in, the ter in a way that uh, the longer you're with them, the um, the more perks and benefits they give you. Hmm. So once you're with them, they don't want to, you don't want to change because you start from zero all over again with a new company. <laughs> I, I think your, uh, your speech is... Uh... Taking C.J. Davidson down a down a fun track. This brings to mind the image of the older couple hand in hand jumping naked off their cottage dog financially. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so to have the cottage, you got to be financially fit, and to be able to run naked off a dog and jump in the lake, you got to be physically fit and probably <laughs> mentally fit, or maybe unfit. I'm not sure where that would come from. <laughs> That's kind of funny. So but, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I thought Dave was going to say something there. I, I, well, I'll go ahead then. Um, so, Howard, um, looking at uh, your websites and, and what have you, it's like I noticed that you've been involved in organizing various writers' retreats and networking. And yeah. you also promote flamenco dancing, mm -hmm. which is kind of amazing. And it sounds like you're someone who really enjoys bringing people together and helping others. Is this one of your main motivators? Sorry, is this one of my? Your main motivators. Oh, absolutely. Um, I've always been an educator, or, or almost all of my life I've been an educator. And um, I love people. I love meeting new people. And uh, through my work in, uh, in Rotary, so I'm a Rotarian, uh, I, um, we we are serious about making the world a better place to live and making our community a better place to live and helping people. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Through that, through flamenco, uh, my wife and I have traveled quite a bit in Spain. And uh, over the years, we've seen many, many good flamenco uh, dancers, musicians. And when we found out that we found this young couple here in Waterloo who, um, she dances beautifully and her husband plays guitar it's it's just a, a wonderful thing to think right here in kitchener waterloo in waterloo region we mm -hmm. have flamenco so my wife and i are uh, promoters and we work on the um the flamenco festival which is if i can make a little plug um Absolutely. it's it's happening this week mm -hmm. and, uh, our gala event is Saturday at the Kitchener Market. We'll have paella, we'll have tapas, we'll have sangria, and mm. a lot of live entertainment. We're bringing, we've already brought a couple of people in uh, from Belgium who are um, also guitarist, uh, dancer, a uh, fellow up from uh, New York City who is um, a, a flautist. And uh, yeah, so it should be a, a, a really good bash. Yeah, who says it sounds wonderful? <laughs> it, it will be, yes. We're, and we're very excited that this year we're doing it all live in person. Um, previous mm -hmm. years, of course, during COVID, it was all online, which was um, it was difficult to do. But so this is our fifth year. That's awesome. I remember. Uh, so you are also, correct me if I'm wrong, you're the co-founder of the KW's Writer Alliance? Right? Uh, no, I joined it fairly soon after it was founded. Oh, okay. I just, uh, when I joined it, you seemed to be the 
head honcho in it. So before I met you, the only flamenco I knew uh, was uh, Pink and uh, went by kind of a slightly different name. And I, I know you, you've talked uh, avidly about uh, how much you love flamenco. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I had to look into it because I had no clue what it was. But uh, so, and I was going to say Flamenco Fest is happening right now. And you've already told us about the events. What time is that one running on Saturday? That will be the doors open at, um, oh, now you got me, 6.30. If you, um, if you order the uh, paella, which needs to be ordered by um, Thursday, then let me, just, let me just consult my notes again. But it is, um, yeah, it's starting at, at 6.30. Uh, 7.30 is um, general admission uh, if, you are, if you're not ordering the paella. And are you and your wife in any of them? You, are you just supporters? You, like, do you actually partake in the, the music or the dance? Or no, we're we are sort of wannabes. Um, we we just love, and we've we've kind of learned. We're starting to learn a bit about the clapping. You know how they. So we're we're taking yeah. lessons on on how, and and you need to take lessons on really wow. how to clap in time with the musicians and the uh, singer. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. I also want to touch on what Dave mentioned too. Is uh, you did a writers retreat, and I know you did one last fall, and yeah. I couldn't make it because I was doing something else. Uh, I think I was at the market. I was selling my books at the market. But uh, okay. do you have any more writers retreats scheduled? I do. I have another one scheduled for this fall. Um, same place, same venue. It's a small venue, and we we're trying to keep it small on purpose. So I think last year we ended up with seven of us. Um, oh, and I've just been—I've just been corrected. The doors open at seven o'clock. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, it's good to have a boss, huh? And the show starts at seven thirty. Yes. So. Yes, so I am um, expecting you, Richard, to be there. Uh, that uh... <laughs> I, I look forward to it as long as I'm not uh, booked at uh, some uh, book selling or signing events. Uh, okay. I will definitely uh, look forward to being there. I'm sorry I missed it last year. So mm -hmm. long to January, says, and we're just talking about this. You mentioned uh, on mm -hmm. your website you organize writers retreats. Can you give us more information about that? I would imagine will that go up on your website when you, uh, as soon as you know the details. Um, how do we find? How does someone find out about it? If Wanda wanted to know, how would she know other than going on Howard Pell's website? Wanda, you can send me an email. It's Howard Pell. Uh, it's it's Howard at HowardPell.ca. But um, like I say, it's going to be a small one. Although I have considered uh, organizing something a bit larger. Uh, at the moment, this one is. The one that I am organizing in the fall will be rather small again, primarily because the venue uh, doesn't have a lot of uh, uh, guest rooms. Right. So, yeah. yeah. So, if anyone has any questions about it, they're welcome to contact me and I can give them your information. Absolutely. Or okay. they can just, if you go to my website, which I see is on a little ticker at the mm -hmm. bottom there. Um, just click on uh, contact. Okay, and, good, perfect. Yeah. And I'd, I'd love to talk with people about organizing um, uh, a retreat, yes. Yeah, no, that sounds good. No, I, I've always wanted to do a writer's retreat. I've never done one. So Howard, uh, I, I noticed in your bio, it mentions that you teach writers how to optimize their digital workflows. That sounds incredibly impressive. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about that, perhaps? Yes. Um, so I, I do put on seminars myself, both at the Writers' Retreat and for some of the writer groups, writing groups that I belong to. Um, for me, it's after some 30 years of writing course manuals for my students, uh, you know, I, I, I've got a very definite... A plan of attack. Uh, I know there's an awful lot of seat of the pants writers, and I applaud them wholeheartedly. <laughs> I really wish I could do it the way you two do, but I can't. 160,000 um, words of seat of your pants. 
That is absolutely mm -hmm. incredible. I'm, I'm so impressed. Uh, for me, you know, I start off with with my idea, and I and and I ask myself, I, I sort of ask myself what if questions to get my ideas. Mm -hmm. So, as an example, um, my my novel, I it all started about what if I could create a test to prove that someone is a real reincarnate of a real person. That is, someone died the day that this reincarnate was born. And what if I could prove it? If I could prove that the person who died was reincarnated as this child. So I, I just sort of thought about that and I started tinkering with the idea. And as a matter of fact, it, it was actually a, a, an idea for a, a business because I wanted to say, what if your child, so think, uh, I'll get everybody who's watching this right now. You don't have to write in or anything, but think when you, uh, when you were younger, did you ever have like a deja vu where you knew you had been somewhere or mm -hmm. done something, but you knew it was impossible because you'd never been there before. You, you'd gone to Europe and you looked at a cathedral or something and said, I've been to this cathedral before. Or when you were a child, did you ever sort of have that kind of memory in the back of your mind that I've got a memory of something that I did as an adult and I was somewhere or I did something and and these memories fade I think they fade fairly quickly but I know for me one has always stayed in my mind and I'm not going to tell you what it is but I always felt like there was something that I remember from when I was an adult so I thought if I could prove this, if I could make a test, if I could write this test, then essentially I would be able to leave my my estate, my full estate, to my reincarnate. So I could take it with me. <laughs> Interesting. So what I did with it then was my wife said, no, you're not going to make a business out of this because you retired. Um, but then, so I thought, well, you know what, maybe I'll just write it down. And so I started writing it down and then I said, well, okay, how am I going, how would I present this? And one of the questions I asked my, myself is, um, oh, Wanda, whoa, that's, that is fantastic. <laughs> fantastic, Wanda. And you see, maybe you were, you are a reincarnate of someone else. So I think we saw the show yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Howard. So we're talking about the this is the new book that you're writing, is that correct? Yes. Or, is it written? It's I've just written it and published soon. Um well so my what my my workflow for writing is now I I try to understand or try to think about questions that my students would ask me when I'm writing a, a a teaching manual and then I start with the table of contents and now for a novel there is no table of contents but I write out a plan and uh, I start at the beginning I write down again a table of contents and then when I get to the end okay what happens at the end so now I've got a roadmap and I can essentially start with a skeleton and then start putting a little bit of meat on the skeleton and then put more meat on it and then pour more meat on it and finally put some skin on the whole thing. Uh, so that's, that's that part of it. There is a mechanical part to it, of course, where I use a piece of software called Scrivener and I'm not, mm -hmm. I don't get paid by them for promoting their software, but I've been using it now for about eight years, nine years. And I think it's the absolute best writing tool, um, best for organizing your writing. It's a text editor, but it's also a mechanism to keep all of your stuff in one place. So I do the seminars on that as well. Hmm. Yeah, I use Scrivener as well. A lot of authors use that one. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I do these, these are free seminars that I give. They're seminars to writers groups. 
Mm-hmm. And to, well, anyone who's interested. So you mentioned that, uh, you know, you have meager writer in the beginning, you, but you had uh, some short stories published in magazines. Uh, you now have two books out and you've got the third, which is a fiction novel. It's a slate to come out soon. And we're, we're kind of hoping in six to six to eight weeks. Uh, yeah. What, what was the actual epiphany? I know you might have touched on this, but what was the actual epiphany that started you down the road to become an actual published author? Like, I know, I know you set out uh, to write these tales to your friends and family about being mm-hmm. fit for retirement, but yeah. still that, you know, we, are, we can all think of that kind of stuff. But what's that, what was that defining moment that made you think, you know, I want to become a writer? I think it was when I, I had the first book and I was planning. The whole plan was I was going to write a blog for my friends and my family. And then I got so much encouragement from it. And then when I actually held that book in my hand, that physical mm-hmm. book, and the very first, the first one off the press, and it was like, oh my gosh. That's I a did, I did mm-hmm. this. And I think it's such a, uh, it was a huge accomplishment for myself. I mean, I know it's for many authors, it is, a you know, you're spending two, three mm-hmm. years on writing a book and it's yeah. a huge accomplishment. And I was just absolutely thrilled with the whole thing. And even picking up today, um, a couple of weeks ago, picking up the first proof from the printer and walking out the door with it. And my wife took a picture of me <laughs> flipping through the pages and was like, this is what I produced this. I did this, mm. you know, and it's just such a. Um, it's an incredible was, feeling and it never, it never ever gets old. I think. Yeah. I was just going to say that you gave me goosebumps to talking about it. Like every single book that you yeah. hold in your hand that you wrote is, um, you know, just feels like it's the first one. Yeah. Mm. So one of your books uh, is called Retire Fit with Safe Workouts. Right. Um, Could you tell us what the acronym SAFE means in this context? I was just about to ask you that. Good, good. Uh, SAFE stands for... Mind reading. (laughs) (laughs) There's not much mind to read here, Dave. (laughs) (laughs) It stands for uh, strong. So you want to be strong enough to do the things that you want to do. Like if you're gardening, uh, mm-hmm. you want to be strong enough to pick up a shovel or lift a bag of topsoil or mulch, whatever. Um, and strong enough to pick up your canoe or even to put your bicycle up on the roof rack of your car. Um, mm-hmm. So depending what you want to do, or even traveling. Are you, you, I know your everyone's suitcase has wheels on it, but I've seen people on airplanes really struggle to put that suitcase up in the higher mm. uh, rack. Or when you get to your um, your chateau in France and you realize that your, <laughs> your room is on the third floor <laughs> and there's no elevator. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So you want to be uh, strong for that. You need to be able, able to do things, which is, you know, uh, for example, my wife has some impingement in her shoulder, so it's not a question of strength; it's a question of of this mm-hmm. impingement. So, for her to paddle a canoe is no longer an option, which she is very sad about. So, you need to be able for that. You need to be flexible, um, where there are times when, oh, let's say you're traveling in Spain and. Uh, you go where uh, you're, you're having lunch at a cozy little restaurant, get up to go to the washroom and find out that the washroom is no bigger than a bathroom on an airplane. And mm-hmm. you need to be have that flexibility to get into that bathroom and <laughs> close the door. Uh, so you need flexibility. And the last one, the E is uh, stands for energetic. So mm-hmm. do you have the motivation? Do you have the... Mm, the energy to do the things to to pick up your grandchildren and swing them around and and that uh, you won't get tired out before they get tired out. <laughs> did you make that acronym up yourself, or did you find that somewhere? No, no, no. We made it up ourselves. That's awesome. So, um, yeah, oh yes, and, and also fun. that. So the energy is partially energy, but it's partially endurance as well. That 
You mm. can go all day uh, if you're on a sightseeing tour. And and uh, uh, when they say, okay, everybody off to, uh, you got you know, three hours to go see a castle or cathedral or something, and that you don't sit on the bus waiting for everyone to get back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting you talked about uh, uh, going to that chateau in France. You know, we're so used to in here in North America that there's not too many places that you go to stay overnight that do not have elevators. We went to Scotland and we had this place right, you know, right on the, the Atlantic Ocean. And we were up on the third floor and there was a winding narrow staircase and we had heavy bags and there was no lift. Like we had to actually physically carry them up the stairs. Yes. And and they, even for me, I, I, I figure I'm a decently strong person. It was a challenge to get them up. And then, uh, you know, it's easier getting them down, you just let them go. But, <laughs> but you, you certainly have to think of it when you go to different countries, for sure. Uh, yes. It's, and, uh, and especially too, when your host is a 90 year old frail woman mm -hmm. who said, well, you've, you, you know, or she hikes up those stairs like they're like it's nothing. <laughs> and you're kind of like, oh, I can't really ask her to carry my luggage. Look, look at her booting up those stairs and I can I couldn't do that. You know, it's, yeah. We were in, we were actually in Switzerland and we were hiking in, in some of the mountains. And this was in uh, Appenzell where where Heidi was from, if you remember mm -hmm. the story of Heidi. Oh, CJ. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> uh, we were in Appenzell and um, we were kind of huffing and puffing going up these hills. And there would be these short little people and they elderly people just running, you know, not running, but they were just going up the hills like they were nothing. And mm -hmm. you know, to them, it was nothing. But to us, living in Ontario, how many hills do we climb you know, on a daily basis? Not very many. No, we don't have real hills in Ontario. No, no, that's for sure. We're a big lake, so maybe we're good swimmers. Yeah. <laughs> Richard, did she call you a weak Sassanac? Yes, she did. Yes, <laughs> you got to watch those Scottish women. Yeah, she should have warned me too. It was her country, so like when we went over there, she should have given me prior warning before we got there that I'm going to have to do a lot of lugging. But uh, but it's, it's true. Like you're going to the castles and like that cathedral I mentioned earlier, like. Mm -hmm. You don't know what you're going to expect. So to actually enjoy the actual cathedral, like anyone can walk to the front doors yes. and you can look around, wow, this is pretty cool. But there's so many little side bits that really make the tour so special. And if you're not physically able to do so, you're really missing out on uh, a lot of experience. So, oh, yes, yes. And and it it can be dangerous. We've, like I say, we've met people who have, um, you know, the – uh, some of those cathedrals, or even the old pubs, and David, you might know this. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, Notice he went to you, Dave, when he said pubs. They yeah, did. those pubs can definitely be dangerous. <laughs> well, yes, and, and they were built before there were any kind of rules or regulations about yep. high, how high a step might, must be. Mm. So you might have a little wee step like this, and when you leave the pub, and you're walking, and you don't even notice a little step like this, but you do step down on it, mm. not expecting to. Um, we've met people who've done that sort of thing where they they miss the step because the step was a, not the right height, not the right height, not the uh, mm -hmm. height that we're expecting uh, steps. And they'll they'll twist an ankle, they'll, um, they'll hurt their mm -hmm. knees. Um, there's a lot of things that can, and especially if you don't have the um, uh, if you don't have the uh, your sense of balance. Mm. Balance is so important. And if you spend your time in the pub for long enough, to, <laughs> but you will lose your sense of balance. <laughs> so we we're talking earlier about your first fiction novel, Lives Lived. Yes. And we're expecting it out. We're not quite sure yet. It'll be six to eight weeks. Uh, you, you were saying six, but I, I know how things go. And sometimes they go a bit longer, but yes. let's, let's hope we get it out in six weeks. But uh, CJ is saying, do you have any ideas for your next novel? Is, is there another one in... Uh, is there a sequel or is there something totally different? Um, there's something totally different. Um, I'm working on uh, a science fiction. Oh, nice. Right? Because there, there will be rocket ships involved. And uh, so I'm just exploring different things now in my writing. Uh, I Actually, I've got two books that I want to write next. I've actually started writing. 
Uh, one is a science fiction one, which is looking at um, kind of post-apocalyptic, uh, what happens after climate change and where do we go from there once, um, you know, once, once our, our climate has overheated or, or you know, what it's, you know, it's up to speculate, it's all speculation right now. So um, I'm, I'm writing this one. And then after that, I've decided to, to write a James Bond. Um, mm. And again, they come from this sort of what if, I, you know, when I'm thinking, I just make sort of what if, if there's a, a short story I'm working on now from, um, I got from a read of another novel and there was just one line in this novel that the author put in and, and never came back to it uh, and said something to the effect of um, uh, John entered the room and I could see that he hadn't changed the color of his skin to match the party colors and then went on from there. So I thought, you know, what if you could change the color of your skin and not just make it um, darker or lighter, but what if you could really change the color? What if you could make it like this color blue or, you know, shocking pink or bright yellow? And so I'm writing a short story about that now. And although some people seem to, and Richard, I think you were at one of those uh, writers group meetings where I posed um, the question of how am I going to end this darn thing? Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, I've got a few ideas on how the end smurfs. <laughs> <laughs> we can have a smurf party. There you go. Yes. Now, now, do you think that would make it, you know, and I, I don't, I'm not picking on women at all here, but I, I actually admire, uh, an envious, I should say of women because, uh, I, the choices of holdings that they have, like as a guy, we put on a t-shirt and a pair of jeans and that's it. We're done. Yes. Whereas women, one day they have shirts on, sometimes they have skirts on, they have dresses and they have all these fancy clothes and stuff like that. Yeah, I'd never be able to pull them off. But would that make their choices, would their wardrobe get bigger now that they can change skin color or would their wardrobe get smaller because they can actually well, I mean, uh, just adapt to their clothing? One of the ideas I had was you could have like, um, if you would have groups of people who all change their skin uh, color to the same color. So if you all decided that uh, you're going to get into, uh, I don't know, one of your groups that you belong to, they all decided they were going to make their skin purple. Then you could have like purple parties and everyone would just come and get <laughs> get naked and be just this sea of purple. Um, That'd be good yeah, for sports. You have a very dangerous mind, don't you? <laughs> That'd be good for sports teams, though. I think you could really... Uh... Yeah, you have the red team against the white team, and that's the one team's red. Was like, that's pretty neat. Sure. <laughs> but I was also thinking about sort of, in you know, in a more serious vein, I was thinking about well, what would be the social implications of, of that? Mm. You know, would we all end up uh, turning black? Would we all end up turning white? Would we all end up turning yellow? Uh, would we? Would there be? Um, all kinds of new prejudices that would arise, you know, well, we just don't like purple people for mm. whatever reason it might be. Or we don't like Smurfs, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, or we don't like Teletubbies. Um, I, I'm just throwing this out. But there's all kinds of possibilities when I ask myself these sort of what if questions. No, absolutely. And you know what, and, and we can take a, like a social view on it right now, like, uh, you know, with the, all the trials that we're having on in our world today, that uh, maybe not as a, that's not a right, right way to say it. I want to say this delicately, but uh, if we could somehow uh, change our color to fit into a different society mm -hmm. and experience what they actually go through, you know, we can try to sympathize and empathize and everything else, but until we actually walk the walk in their shoes, Yes. We really have no idea right. what they're talking about. You know, we right. listen and it goes, you know, we try to digest it, but until you actually experience it, you cannot emotionally feel I'm, what I'm, this other person is going through. That would be a very neat teaching experience, if nothing else. Well, I'm ashamed to admit that I don't recall the gentleman's name, but it was back in the 50s, I think, where 
he underwent skin treatments to turn his skin black. And there was some doctor who was dead set against this, but eventually con convinced him. He was a journalist, convinced his doctor to give him this therapy for weeks uh, to turn his skin black. And he went and he lived in black communities to, um, to do just that. And he wrote a couple of books on, every one book was called Black Like Me. Fascinating book, fascinating. I bet it would be. Uh, what, what he went through, and he said, you know, as a white man, things that he did as a white man now were suddenly completely unavailable to him. Mm -hmm. mm. And that was back then. I imagine it must have. You know, we think that we've come a long way, and then uh, you, you hear some of the reports, and you figure we haven't come anywhere. Uh, but I can just imagine how much more difficult it would have been back in the fifties, for sure. I just got a text. And the gentleman's name is John Howard Griffin. So if you if you find his book Black Like Me, uh, John Howard Griffin, uh, it's yeah. Wait, I feel like we're actually on a show. Who wants to be a millionaire? You keep getting a call a friend in the text, and the, <laughs> like, who is your secret? Uh, I can't support? tell you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's just, yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's awesome. It's actually CJ who's sending me all of these texts. Oh, nice. <laughs> That's awesome, Howard. So uh, we look forward to your first fiction novel, Lives Lived. And you were saying that it's, you think it's coming out in six weeks. Is that your plan? I'm hoping so, yes. Six or seven but, weeks, yeah. But there's no date set? In there's no date set. And I think it's primarily because um, there is a paper shortage. And I didn't realize this in the, in the printing industry right mm -hmm. now. So, um, in fact, I couldn't even get the color paper that I wanted. I'm just getting plain white because they just didn't have oh, wow. They didn't have the cream, right? The stock that I wanted. And that is so, yeah, yeah. Well, I look forward to when it comes out and uh, mm. make sure that uh, we get our uh, signed copy. We'll be by to pick one up. So definitely, that's the nice thing is you're local. So yes. it's about less than a half hour drive for for me to come get it. So thank you for being on the show today, Howard. And if you uh, you know, publish another novel next year at some point or whenever, and you want to come back on our show. Uh, just uh, hook me up and uh, I'll send you out the, the links and Thank you're you. welcome to come back in. I think we, uh, I think our people really enjoyed listening to uh, you talk about uh, your nonfiction books, uh, Retire Fit, Fit and Fit, and yes. uh, the steps that we need to take. And, you know, it, it's, if you're young, you don't really appreciate it. And, you know, yeah, whatever. I was in those shoes before too, but now that I'm not in those shoes, I'm in the older shoes. Yeah. It's so poignant. Everything that you brought up is so true because, mm -hmm. uh, well, one thing, one thing I, I, I do say to a lot of people is, you know, what, what age do you start, uh, start planning for your financial fitness? It's tough because life keeps up on you. It does. Mm. It's, yeah. Because you, you, in your 30s, you think, oh, man, that's 30 years away. But you start socking some money away, 10% uh, of your pay or whatever. And then, but you don't do anything physically. You don't say, well, I've got to prepare physically as well as preparing financially. Right. And then that money is really good for nothing other than and, the... Well, people, people retire and they say, oh, I'm retired. Well, now what am I going to do? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess I could clean up the garage. Become a writer. And yes. <laughs> <become> a writer. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I want people to... to Say, look, I've got another 30 or 40 years of life uh, that I need to fill 40 hours a day. And um, what am I going to do with that? I'm not going to sit around and watch TV. So, Corky said, uh, Corky, right up's a great start of my day. It's 5 a.m. there. Wow. <laughs> that's awesome. So, that's good they, morning. They'll be in part of the world that uh, we're traveling to <laughs> with these uh, places that don't have elevators and stuff, maybe. Who knows? Right. right. So, sorry, Howard. So before we before we leave you, uh, you you do have those two nonfiction books out. Uh, where can people find them if they're interested in getting them? Uh, they can go to my website, and uh, they will um, they can order them right from the website. There's a link, or if you happen to be uh, in KW in the Waterloo region area, I'd be happy to autograph a copy for you and bring it over to you. Um, just. Again, go to my website, send me an email. Uh, also, if you do know of the 
the print uh, the print shop here in uh, Kitchener called the Volumes Direct. Uh, you can go to their website and buy it from there. They are available in uh, some of the bookstores in Kitchener Waterloo, not all, but some of them. So and do you have them on Amazon? Uh, I'm sorry. Do you have them on Amazon? Uh, yes, they're on Amazon.com, not on Amazon.ca. Really? Yeah, it's um, it was a funny it was a funny uh, thing, and we said, well, they gave us a choice of, that Amazon.com was going to give us a broader audience, but rather than CA, but I couldn't have both. That's, uh, that's Now uh-huh. this was this was some years ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I plan on having my novel available on. All oh, of sure. Them. You should yeah. have your, you should have it yeah. available everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome, Howard. Again, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we really appreciate listening to uh, your take, especially on retirement. And we, we're happy to have you on. So, Dave, before we leave, uh, is there anything new in the David Kelly universe? Uh, yeah, a couple of things. Um, yesterday, I hit a um, bit of a milestone in the third of the Logan's World series. I hit seventy thousand words. Holy sweat! You're just banging them out now. Yeah, it's uh, the last week or so has been going really well. So uh, yeah, it's it's okay. getting close to the end. And then the other thing for me is uh, on Saturday, I will be in Capriol at the Capriol right. Arena. Uh, for the Capri Old Days Festival. Uh, so if anybody in the area wants to come out and uh, talk to me about books or pick up a copy or anything, uh, I'll be there from 10 until 3 o'clock. Awesome. Hmm. And what about you, Richard? Well, just uh, for me, I, I couldn't find my iPad today, but <laughs> I will be at uh, the Ontario Pirate Festival uh, all weekend. It's a civic Arr. event in Canada, and I will have an eye patch. Uh, my wife will be making one for me, and I'll be selling and signing books at the Pirate Festival Saturday, Sunday, and Monday in Guelph at Martin Park. If anyone's familiar with Guelph, Ontario, uh, Martin Park is just outside of Guelph, uh, just off Highway 6. So it's going to be a fun event. I believe it's from 11 till 6 all three days, uh, but you can check my website at www.richardhstevens.com. And uh, my wife updates uh, everything, all my uh, places I'll be appearing, and she's got all the details in there. She so don't have to go searching for it. So uh, that's what's new with me. And Wind Walker is going through its uh, final editing stage now, and my goal is to have it for Fan Expo in Toronto. Uh, I've been invited to be a guest author there, which is maybe a big deal. We'll see. But uh, I'll be schmoozing with uh, all the hobbits and William Shatner and. Uh, uh, Sons of Anarchy and all those people that I'm sure they probably won't come down to see me, but uh, <laughs> I will be uh, a little awestruck if I see them walk by and maybe I'll be able to sign a book for one of those guys. It'd be really cool. So that's basically what's new with me. And next week's guest will be nonfiction children's auth- book author Thorsten Nash. Thorsten is an award winning bilingual author. His novels are read in schools from Denmark to Italy is currently writing a dystopian novel funded by a personal literary arts grant from the Alberta Foundation for the Arts. So it'll be interesting to have a nonfiction children's book on. I want to find out exactly what that means, because generally when I hear children's book, I think of Hardy Boys and stuff like that, and there's certainly fiction. So that'd be interesting. So anyway, for uh, David Kelly and Christy Stratos, who couldn't be here today, uh, she sent her regrets. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and uh, hopefully you'll join us again next week. And in two weeks from now, uh, speaking about pirates and pirate festivals, we're going to have a pirate live read where we're going to invite three authors to read excerpts from their books. Ooh. Dave, Christy, and myself will uh, take part in, and I will be wearing something like this, guaranteed, and I'll have an eye patch on, and uh, <laughs> maybe I might have to lop off a hand and put a hook on there or something for the live read. So anyway, I look forward to doing that. I love doing the live read. So uh, mm. Tune in on uh, August 9th, I guess, and it'll be a lot of fun. So until we meet again, I hope everyone has a great week. Take good care. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye.